Hello, guys. It is August 14th. I have another awesome guest on the podcast today, Samantha Radakia. She is the author of Bitcoin Pizza, a brand new book that she is releasing on August 20th. So make sure you pick up a copy of her book at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the other wonderful places that you buy books. She is a Forbes contributor for crypto and blockchain. She was on the Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2017 for enterprise tech, and overall, she's very impressive. You guys are going to like her. As always, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and share this episode with somebody that you think would like to learn more about blockchain, maybe a friend, a colleague, a family member. Spread the word. Enjoy. This is the Block Hash Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Really, really excited to hear a bit more about your background and everything. So what's what's your story? How did you kind of get into what you do now and crypto and and whatnot? Yeah. So, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I think it, it's cool to, to, I think you're the first person I've spoken to who's written a book. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I do have that background. <laughs> um, it, so, I mean, like most of us, I have a pretty varied background. Um, I, I grew up with two brothers who were really into gaming. And so by extension, I got really into gaming. Um, and that was kind of, you know, what we did before even esports was really a thing. We were like competing on the weekends in clans on this game Tribes 2 and then got into Warcraft and, and some other things. So um, definitely more involved in that world and familiar with digital assets. Um, and so ultimately, when I got to college, I, I didn't want to study formally like computer science or anything like that since I was doing that for fun on the side. Um, and so I studied anthropology and it was so, it was such like an old and crotchety discipline. Like what I liked was studying behavior and studying, um, you know, human dynamics mm -hmm. in, in systems, but it was still like really archaic at the time. It was like, you go live in some remote place and observe th these people um, so this was around the time, you know, it was like Facebook had taken hold. There were the social, early social networks. Um, and so I tried to convince the department to let me do my uh, thesis, um, you know, studying some sort of digital community. And they were like, no, it's too obscure. So I ultimately convinced them to let me live in the virtual world Second Life. And this was in 2009. Um, and so I... I started, I, I opened like a digital t-shirt shop and I was making Linden dollars and then I was researching the, you know, exchanges um, and, and all of that and kind of stumbled into the world of Bitcoin and, you know, was hooked ever since, not just from like the academic perspective, but obviously just the, you know, the, the other growing macro trends. And so this was like immediately after 2008, I graduated college and, you know, 2011 and it was still we were experiencing the effects of that recession and so the idea of um kind of like traditional jobs that might have been expected did not exist and i think now with sort of these uh the understandings of the changing global economy or automation like this is even more prevalent so you know i was really just interested in the underlying mission and how the world is changing um and then I became an entrepreneur mainly because I was like, I'm going to start a company. I was, you know, watching uh, people start to do different things in class. They were spending a lot of time on laptop computers and online shopping. And so I kind of just like got into this world of tech startups, um, but didn't do anything in the blockchain or crypto, you know, using blockchain technology or in the crypto space until I ended up living in Park City, Utah. Um, and there were some folks out there that were working um, you know, with overstock.com, which was really, you know, Patrick Byrne and the, the company was really early in um, being outspoken, um, you know, with the technology as well as accepting Bitcoin. So, you know, it was kind of fumbling around there, working on some projects, and then ultimately uh, met my co-founders for a company that we started building in 2014 called Chronicled. And that company, really, we were just 
you know, coming as kind of like Bitcoiners, um, but wanting to explore using the technology. So the Bitcoin blockchain for other non-financial use cases. And, you know, we started with a sneaker trading exchange, like collectible (laughs) sneakers, like Jordans and Yeezys, um, and, and then expanded into more complex um, supply chain protocols. And so the company, um, it, it's still growing. It's working mostly in the pharmaceutical industry now. And I, you know, took time to write this book and have been just, you know, so fascinated with educating people about, um, you know, the not necessarily the technology itself and how it works, but more of the implications of, you know, how how our world is changing from the the social or cultural or economic or political perspectives. And so, you know, that's that's how I got to where I am today. And yeah, it's it's been fun so far. Yeah, it sounds fun. It's really cool. It sounds like you've done quite a lot. Um and you wrote a anthropology thesis, correct? Right. Uh what what was your thesis on specifically? So this was the the thesis that got me into um, that I just mentioned the thesis on Second Life. So the Linden Labs virtual world uh, for the the listeners who don't know called Second Life. And at the time, you know, it was a very kind of simple rud- rudimentary virtual world. It wasn't necessarily a game. It was a, a venue or place for um, people uh, to you know congregate, create a digital economy, open a T-shirt shop. Um, you know, go to a Fat Boy Slim concert, uh, things like that. And now we've seen, obviously, for anyone who has uh, kids in middle school or high school or even adults, you know, we know we're aware of Fortnite and some of these bigger um, experiences that people have gotten involved in. And so, uh, yeah, that thesis was an ethnography, meaning I I lived in that world and and basically just observed um, all aspects of of life, whether that is, you know, economic exchange or governance or, you know, what people do for fun or what are relationships and dating like and, or, you know, marital structure, like the the very traditional uh, anthropological things, but of like second life avatars. So it's been really cool um, to see, to see that dialogue expand, not just in terms of like, non-fungible tokens and in scarce digital assets. Um, But one, like the company itself, uh, Linden Labs making high fidelity, which is actually, you know, kind of the the 2.0 version of the second life that is VR enabled and and incorporating um, its own cryptocurrency. So to anticipate, I would say they were way, way ahead of their time in anticipating, uh, you know, where we have ended up now. Um, in, in building on that thesis mm-hmm. and it was cool to study it then. Yeah. I think we're really on the edge of like this whole VR lifestyle that I think many of us, especially millennials and younger than us are going to really experience where you're going to be able to go into VR and, and like live like an ordinary life, but enhanced, be able to do all these different things you wouldn't be able to do normally in the real world and have all kinds of different um, relationships with people and um, with your own work and your own creations and whatnot. I mean, it, the, it, it's completely limitless what you can do and create in a VR setting like that. So it'd be really, yeah, yeah. A thesis on that must've been really interesting. It, it really was. And again, this was, I mean, some of the, the tech evolutions that were happening at that time was literally the, the difference between, you know, they added voice capability in world, you know, from just the command line interface of like, you know, chatting with Mm -hmm. people to like, how will voice impact virtual worlds? And now it's like, you know, how, how is VR, you know, impacting manufacturing and you can like design a chair in front of your eyes or, you know, hang out with your friends that there's a company I was talking to um, that, you know, they're creating workout machines like gym machines but specifically for vr so their specific machine is a climbing Mm -hmm. machine so you're actually on it climbing but you're in vr and then you can hang out with your friends and go climb the eiffel tower or go go climb el capitan and like it's obviously tailoring these workouts as well um and so there's kind of this like competitive gamified social element as well as um you know 
a more effective kind of like health workout mm-hmm. as well. So it's like, I don't know, it's so crazy to imagine. I mean, I've worked remotely for most of my career, or at least the companies and teams I've built have, you know, always had some sort of element um, of a, a distributed nature, whether it is just a handful of people or it was the entire company. And, you know, we're seeing even now with this growing shift of, of tools and technologies to support uh, remote work, but it's, I feel like it's just accelerating. We'll hit this point where we're all, you know, meeting up to, we're not just doing a podcast over a computer and, you know, talking at a screen, mm-hmm. but you and I will be in some virtual high fidelity coffee shop having a conversation that other people can pop into. So um, I think there, it was, again, it's like cool to see this evolve um, and accelerate so quickly. And I think there's a huge, obviously a huge part of the enabling um, trends or technologies are, uh, again, uh, the crypto side of things or the blockchain side of things. Absolutely. Like I'm, I'm really excited to have my own virtual podcast studio. Like I'm working very hard on <laughs> making that happen. So I, really? Yeah. I mean, it's not like completely feasible yet, but I mean, like as soon as audio is like working really well in world and then you have the ability to meet up and there's a lot of ways to meet up, but you got to be able to coordinate with people. You don't, you want to have good, um, latency. You don't want to have any issues with that because you want everything to feel as as in person as possible so Mm -hmm. i'm i'm working hard and trying to stay on the cutting edge of that like that'd be awesome to have guests like on the podcast and then like virtually like interact with them and have something more engaging Um, because it's completely different to have a conversation in person than it is like over um the computer like we are right now like it's it's more engaging when you can see someone's face and their hand gestures and um see when they're rolling their eyes see uh see when their eyes light up i mean like all that stuff like plays into the social fabric of being human so it'd be really cool to really engage in that in vr like really excited for all of that yeah likewise i mean i think it's beyond just an inevitability it's it's something that we're desperately lacking right now so i mean a lot of the trends that I've been excited to research, but also I find are, are troubling is that we had this, this explosion or this, this wave of technology enabled by, you know, web 2.0 or mobile phones or faster internet connections, or now even 5g. And, you know, it's great. And we've become, you know, overnight, a, a globalized, uh, you know, all global citizens, but at the same time, it moves so quickly that we, became disconnected. Um, And that's where we started seeing the erosion of trust. And I think that's why there was such a unique, you know, there's this unique time period where people were were ready to, um, you know, embrace a technology, not just like Bitcoin, but, you know, beyond it, the whole premise of, um, you know, placing either not, you know, not needing trust, but placing trust in a protocol or system as opposed to institutions and and centralized governing bodies. And so like, I just think it's, we still have some of these trust gaps and, or just gaps in general. And I'm excited for the use of technology to, you know, be used to restore those connections in whatever way, whether that's like an economic exchange or it's, you know, helping people, you know, feel like we are connecting to other human beings um, through VR or AR or, um, you know, connecting more with the products that we consume or enabling more localized production or peer-to-peer networks of, you know, local farmers as opposed to like the big in- industrial agricultural mm-hmm. uh, supply chains. And so I, I think there's this trend towards, um, you know, peer-to-peer networks is so much bigger if you think about it theoretically, um, than just, you know, kind of one facet of society. Yeah. Tech, the tech will definitely fill in all those gaps, especially the whole decentralized like revolution that we're going through. It'd be really cool. Like mm-hmm. in VR for me to give you like a virtual Bitcoin for like a virtual yeah. copy of your book. Like that's something I'm yeah. excited for. Like the whole commerce aspect of it. Yeah, me too. Um, so since we're already talking about your book, let's talk about it. <laughs> um, 
So can, can you give like a back cover summary of what your book is going to be about? Yeah. So the book, there are so many amazing resources out there um, that are either more technical deep dives or focused more primarily on Bitcoin or some that are focused more on blockchain technology, the underlying technologies, um, and some focused on the high level you know, economic trends. And so where I saw that there was a gap, and this is just in the, you know, from my experience running a company that was using some of these technologies and obviously like working with customers and and people, there was still this gap in kind of the, the zero to one of understanding, okay, there's all these resources of like, I can do this deep dive into the tech or you know, understand proof of work or understand proof of stake, but there weren't a lot of people looking at why this is important Mm -hmm. or why you should get involved or like, what's the call to action. And so again, this book is written for the people who, you know, your kids, you've heard about it because you're, you have kids who talked about it over Thanksgiving, or you have seen it on mainstream media now on CNBC and are like, what, what the heck is everyone talking about? Um, and are still confused as the where, or like, you know, I've met a lot of people who's, um, who work in organizations and, you know, their bosses are saying, you've got to learn about blockchain and they're like, okay, what, you know, it, it, and it doesn't have really uh, a relevant day-to-day, um, impact on their lives, which it, it does and will, and these technologies are very important. And so it was, it's kind of, was it the goal to write the book was a fun um, hopefully entertaining, light read um, that isn't intimidating, that doesn't get too far into the weeds, but provides like a good high level um, overview of why this is important and resources to help you learn more if that's what you're interested in. And mm-hmm. um, again, from my perspective as an anthropologist, like studying the the ecosystem, the community, the culture behind this. So, you know, terms like to the moon, or HODL, or all, all of these stories, these myths and origin stories that shape um, our realities, and no different than when you're talking about, you know, the origin of a country or nation state, or the origin of a company, you know, the myth of um, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak starting, you know, Apple in a garage, and like these stories become really important um, to the culture. And so if you look at, uh, you know, the the Bitcoin and crypto and, and block, you know, larger blockchain, if you can call it like a community. Um, there are so many of these origin stories and cultural artifacts already that, you know, a lot of people are not focusing on. So it's kind of, you know, even the namesake of the book, Bitcoin pizza, um, you know, it's not just a facetious title or it's, I'm not just obsessed with pizza. Although I really like, I like pizza (laughs) a lot. (laughs) <laughs> but you know that that's a very specific story in the history um, of this mm-hmm. space that you know didn't necessarily mark the first commercial transaction or you know transaction on the Bitcoin network. Of course, there you know were transactions before that, but it's the first sort of kind of mainstream adopted story of someone um, buying you know real w- world goods. Uh, two Papa John's pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin. And of course that, you know, garnered a lot of media attention as the price of Bitcoin has gone up and everyone's like, those are really expensive pizzas. But I mean, it's, it's, you know, the book really goes into, um, you know, a lot of these types of stories that give you more, you know, not just the what, but the emotional connection uh, to the evolution of the space. Absolutely. And that's really awesome too. And we need more books um, like the ones you're writing too, because there's a lot of ordinary people out there. I mean, most people are the ordinary people that don't understand crypto and blockchain still, and they need an easier way to digest some of this stuff. Yeah, and totally. And again, I mean, for those who do end up getting the book, and I hope that they do, um, you know, there is a surprise at the end that I'm working on that will be an interactive experience and it does involve pizza and it does involve Bitcoin. So, you know, to make a fun experience where, you know, if you want to get involved and it's intimidating or you're scared or you're like, I don't know, I don't want to like risk losing all my money or making a lot of money, like whatever it is, you know, it can be super simple 
um, to, to get involved and feel confident, build your confidence and learn more. So that really, you know, some, what's better than something as ordinary as pizza. Hey, you had me at pizza, so I'll be looking for that for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, no, that's awesome. That's really cool that what you're doing with it. What was your inspiration behind writing this book? Was it just off of whim and knowledge, um, around the space that you've learned or was it something, um, more personal or what was it that inspired you to put all the work in to do this? I mean, it's exactly that. It's, I I don't want to say ordinary in a negative Mm -hmm. sense, but it's the ordinary everyday people. It's, you know, it's to my parents who for years struggled to explain to their friends or family members what the hell it is that I do for a job. You know, they like that issue too. So I say like, it's for all those people out there and it's for, you know, I was sitting in, this was probably in the the height of craziness in 2017 to, you know, I was listening to my Uber driver giving advice, you know, investment advice or how to buy crypto to his friend on the phone. And I gave him a friendly tap and like educated him a little bit more. So he didn't make a terrible decision. I mean, it's to, it's to the people who maybe have been disenfranchised by the current systems or feel disempowered. And, you know, it's a very inclusive um, space and, and model. And the more people that we get involved earlier, I mean, it's still, on one hand, we've made a lot of progress, tons of progress, it, it, extremely fast progress, but at the same time, it's still early enough to get involved and really be part of um, making big decisions and, and building the future of you know our society and so you know i i felt inspired to at least provide some sort of guidance or or an easy inroad for people that otherwise would feel um intimidated because it is intimidating it's i mean technology is intimidating finance is intimidating all of these things you know and i'm like a woman in the space so even when i started making building companies and I was out fundraising. I mean, that even doing that was like an intimidating thing. So, um, you know, it's for all the people that maybe want to feel a little bit more confident about, you know, understanding the high level space, but also knowing like the terminology and just, you know, feeling like they're welcome and part of, um, the community. Yeah. That's all really, really cool. And very excited to read it and kind of dive into uh, what what you got. But, you know, I've been talking about that for, for like the last two years, like the real issue with this industry still, I mean, we could argue that the issues have to do with scalability, not having an institutional investors um, or the comparisons between Bitcoin and gold and then the economy. I mean, there's a lot mm-hmm. of things we could argue for why crypto isn't mainstream. But the real issue is that there's not enough education. There's this huge divide between this technology that's incredibly advanced that solves all these problems, like all these problems. And then there's the ordinary person who's riding the subway, who's just trying to buy a coffee that doesn't understand what this virtual, um, intangible thing is that you can't hold in your hands, you can't put in your wallet, yet somehow it's not controlled by anybody and you can use it to buy a coffee if they accept it for coffee. Like there's just this huge divide. And even when I wrote a book two years ago, the whole goal was to try and take an idea from the space and break it down so that the average person could understand Mm -hmm. it. And like, even over the last two years, we've still had very, very little progression in education. And there's obviously been plenty of books and there's some awesome people in the space that are great educators, but they're doing it still at a very high level. There's just not enough literature or podcasts or information out there that really breaks it down. Um, What I really like about your book and what I've seen so far from it is how it really takes these ideas, the culture behind it, uh, the symbolism, the people, and breaks it down, makes it digestible like pizza, (laughs) at least from my perspective. I love that part of it. Yeah. And I think that was the most challenging. So on one hand, I wanted to like, leverage my skill sets best. And what I have always been pretty good at is taking complex ideas and distilling them. There is always 
the risk of distilling it too far or abstracting it away too far. And so there have been, you know, it was incredibly difficult to synthesize all of, I mean, even the, sh- the stories. Um, so, you know, the story of Hodel, which was a drunk comment on the Bitcoin talk forum that ultimately, you know, people started saying meant hold on for dear life. Like I had to distill that concept and the, otherwise I would have had like a 3000 page anthology of every nuance. And so it's like, it was really, really difficult to make, um, you know, decisions in terms of what was the appropriate level to distill something from the perspective of like an average person who doesn't necessarily, um, you know, want to dive into the nitty gritty details or go down the rabbit holes. But the thing is, like, the goal is to have enough of an overview of these stories or these concepts. So like, if you want to learn more, about proof of work or mining or how you can get more involved. Like if that part of it really excites you, then yeah, you can pick up your book and go, you know, keep going down these rabbit holes. Um, And so, you know, that was really the goal. And I'm still seeing, you know, I totally agree with you with, you know, on one hand, we can make these arguments about uh, the technical challenges, the engineering challenges, but I think the, the most grossly overlooked side of our space that is now getting more attention is like the social engineering required uh, to not just get mainstream adoption and educate people, but also, you know, kind of uh, align incentives on these networks. It's incredibly complex. Um, The the shifts that we're talking about are, you know, on a a global scale and they're mostly, um, they require changing like our social operating system. And that's like a, that's a, a lifetime worthy project. And so I think that's from my perspective and I, I like tech, like I'm a techie person. Um, so technical challenges do excite me, but I think it's the, you know, the social engineering challenges that are just incredibly interesting and even asking questions that are still being discussed around things like governance um, and, and like, you know, how these networks are, uh, you know, governed. And there are a lot of debates in terms of what even constitutes uh, merit or of being called a blockchain. And so I think, again, I kind of like touch on some of these high level questions, but, you know, the answers are still being written today. Yeah, I think you nailed it on the head there. I think the biggest thing that we're going to see is a social social rewiring aspect in people. Um, And with Bitcoin alone, people are starting to think about what money is like for the first time in like a long mm-hmm. time. And my, my background's in, in neuroscience. So I think about things a little bit more analytically than normal. Um, but from a social perspective, I mean, there's a lot of people that look at money a certain way and they see that as the U S dollar that I might have in my pocket. Um, and they see gold as maybe money in some sense or some store of wealth or some investment, but they don't really see money from a much broader perspective, let alone really understand the history of money. And the awesome thing about Bitcoin is the whole symbolism behind it and how it really draws you in and in an interesting way, indirectly educates you on what money is because you really have to think about Bitcoin to really understand it. Mm -hmm. And I think the more people understand Bitcoin, the more people will understand what money is and I think that's a fantastic thing for a society. I think you're going to see this massive social rewiring in people and how we think about money. And then that'll lead into technology and how we use it and how our lives um, go about from there. I think we're definitely in for some social changes in society. I totally agree. And even in my acknowledgments, you know, I, I say to Satoshi, um, you know, at the very least, thank you for starting a much needed conversation. And that was just that. I mean, Bitcoin, Bitcoin has done so much. But if you look at the most fundamental level, it started this conversation on the nature of money, and therefore the nature of government, the nature of society or reality itself. And so as you start, and it's amazing to see the evolution, even in mainstream media, where you know, there was a lot of hype and a lot of focus around pricing. And then, of course, there's a lot of focus on Bitcoin is dead and like, this stuff is a scam. And then there, you know, now there are these long 
think pieces. I, I saw something the other day from the New Yorker, you know, that, that was going into just kind of, again, the history of money or, um, you know, other great resources or books. I, I really liked Debt, The First 5,000 Years by David Graeber. I mean, that's that's a really comprehensive book if you want to get into like a thousand plus pages on, uh, you know, kind of the history of debt. But, you know, I, fundamentally, I think a lot of people forget and, uh, you know, no penalty on them for forgetting that we're all just living our lives. But all of these things, including money, are social constructs. Um, they were created at some point in time. And that also means it can be challenged or changed. And the the way that things are working now or have been operating, um, you know, we're not always the case and it's gone through various different cycles or evolutions. And so um, I think that's a very powerful idea to, to start to di- digest. And that makes you question a lot of, you know, they're, they're difficult questions to ask and they, they involve, you know, even harder answers and more complex technology to fix some of the the problems that we've seen. So, you know, I'm really, I just feel honored to be a part of this in whatever small or large way that I can. Um, And I also feel so, you know, honored and privileged to like have conversations like this and that more conversations like this are taking place. Yeah. It's, it's fun having conversations like this. It's very stimulating in a lot of ways and hopefully Satoshi Nakamoto reads your book. Um, Who, (laughs) Do you think Satoshi is a oh. a he, a she, a, a they? Like, who do you think Satoshi is? I don't. I won't speculate. <laughs> I don't know. I think more likely a, a they, um, or I mean, I think that's on the other topic of origin stories and myths. I mean, it, it, Satoshi is intentionally, uh, you know, no one and everyone, mm-hmm. and so when you see people in the shirts that are, I am Satoshi. It's almost like a a religious uh, movement or ecosystem or like something akin to that. And I think that that was very intentional for people to be able to identify or see themselves um, in this movement and having it stand for something so much larger than any individual or group of persons control or leadership. And it would just also, you know, the idea of someone coming forward would go be completely at odds with the general uh, beliefs um, around decentralization. So, you know, I've, I've never really spent a lot of time uh, trying to debunk or, uh, you know, do that. I mean, there's a chapter that kind of introduces the concept of, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto for, for those who, um, you know, don't know and might want to be interested going down that. But I think, um, again, the anonymity is is what one aspect that uh, makes this powerful. Yeah. I, I think there's far more symbolic symbolism behind Satoshi Nakamoto than it is a physical person or a physical group. Um, and yeah, you do see a lot of people walk around with those t-shirts uh, that say like, we are mm-hmm. Satoshi and whatnot, but it's true. I mean, if you really think about what Bitcoin is and the fact that it's not controlled by a single person and that Satoshi Nakamoto stepped out of that limelight to let it become what it is today. Bitcoin really does represent two things. It represents all of us as a whole, as a, as mm-hmm. a unity. And at the same time, it represent, represents us as individuals with our sovereign rights um, to our own finances, to our own freedom, to our ability to make our own decisions as individuals. And I think that's probably the most important takeaway is that you can have both of those things at the same time without someone in the middle or someone above you telling you how you use Bitcoin. That's probably mm-hmm. the most important part about Bitcoin. And I think a lot of people in the space realize it. I think a lot of people that jump into the space are still kind of getting grasping that. It's hard for a lot of people to see that there is no one behind it and that there, Satoshi Nakamoto might not even be a real person. Uh, that 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 right. gets people really confused every time I try to explain Bitcoin. They're like, well, where, where did he go? Like, <laughs> you can't just like completely <laughs> disappear. Like, where's Satoshi? Like, can I interview him? Can I talk to him? Like, no, we don't know where he is. No one knows where he is um, yeah. or if he exists. Right. Or, yeah. So it's, it's quite interesting to think about, but I don't overly ponder it because 
you get quite a headache. <laughs> right. And again, I, I think it, if you get past that, I think that it's, that's the most beautiful aspect of the myth or the, the movement that Satoshi, you know, the concept of Satoshi, whether it, it does represent uh, a human being or a group of human beings, or it, you know, is, uh, you know, a concept that is separate from that. Um, it, it's core to the message. Absolutely. So where do you think Bitcoin is going in all of this? And if not Bitcoin, where do you think blockchain is going? Oh, I mean, so I have serious personal tensions, just even in terms of the way I watched my company evolve. So I had multiple co-founders and, um, you know, investors and, and customers, and it ended up going in this direction where, you know, here, here are these like early Bitcoiners, and now it's... it has moved into the space of like creating a permissioned blockchain, you know, like the blockchain side of thing um, for, you know, a, a massive enterprise or industry. Um, and so I always had this tension. And I think a lot of people in the space have the tension one between kind of being more of a Bitcoin maximalist versus in not believing that really like these other blockchain implementations are, are really blockchains. Mm -hmm. Um, are they sufficiently decentralized? Is it a blockchain or even beneficial if you've got a handful of the biggest industries controlling it, um, you know, and more relevant in discussion now today with seeing, you know, Libra and Facebook's initiative and, and really imagining uh, the possibility of something like a Facebook becoming, you know, a central bank under the auspices of, of this technology. So I think we're at we're, I mean, every day is a pivotal moment, it seems, but, um, you know, I really hope to see more consolidation around some of these projects that have moved into the, the private or permission side of things towards public networks or infrastructure, um, which is, a you know, a totally different realm. And again, I, I touch on these topics in the book that doesn't mean that I support them or disagree with them it's just like I tried my best to give an overview of what the current discussions are today um, and take from that what you will I do hope to see more I'm very excited to see more mainstream adoption um, or people um, placing more of that you know, their assets into uh, Bitcoin. I mean, even over this past weekend, we we're seeing uh, kind of the, the challenges in our global trade war with China and, you know, more uh, Chinese buyers coming, you know, placing their faith into Bitcoin. So I think there's a lot to consider. Um, and I, I hope the people who are, you know, building and working so hard on uh, the infrastructure and the tools and the user experiences, you know, continue doing that so well. And, um, you know, that those would be my most basic hopes for the, the community. And also that we have, you know, we work together and we talk openly about these hard questions and we have as seamless of a transition if there is one as possible. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, antagoni antagonistic or scary, but, you know, that, that we do start to transition into better systems. Very excited to, to dive in and learn more about your book. And so when does it come out and where can I buy a copy? So the book comes out on August 20th and you can order it on Amazon, Google Books, Barnes and Noble, all the, all the standard places. And then for those who are listening who want to buy it, with uh, crypto or Bitcoin, I'm, I'm going to put it up on my personal website, which is uh, samantharadakia.com, um, and you could buy it there as well. You hear that, guys? Go buy our book, Bitcoin Pizza. You're going to like it. It's going to be good. <laughs> uh, well, other than the book, what are you doing now? Like, Are you working on any other projects? Um, are you just kind of doing the same stuff as usual, or what, what's going on in your world? Yeah. So... Again, as I, I moved into an advisory role with with my previous company um, and spent the time finishing the book, and I do a lot of speaking and educating. So this fall, um, actually in September, I'll be in Brazil and Chile and Italy 
talking on open finance and, and DeFi and, and some other um, interesting topics like financial inclusion. And in the meantime, I mean, I've been working on a bunch of projects and exploring, you know, really what is the, um, where is the area where I can have the greatest impact in terms of the next company or tool that I build. So, I mean, there are a lot of ideas and, and themes that are discussed in the book that might be related to projects that I'm working on. Um, I'm definitely, again, because of my history in, in gaming and VR, that that certainly interests me in, in whatever tools or services can help to restore connections between people and themselves or people in other, other people or local communities. Um, and then there's also this side of me who has worked really deeply now in in global supply chains and seeing the mess of complexity um, that has been you know caused by kind of these trust gaps there and so again when you're thinking about um, you know buying something whether it's uh, you know clothing or food or a supplement or whatever it might be that you know the amount of steps it needs to go through to get to your door and so like imagining what peer-to-peer networks, um, or more compressed, uh, vertically integrated networks could be for the simplest things that you would want to produce. So, I mean, I'm I'm really uh, exploring quite a bit, but ultimately, um, you know, where it lands is is using this technology to empower people and not entrench them. So, you know, that's kind of my core operating principle. And that's definitely what I'll be working on next. Very cool. Sounds like you keep yourself busy, so it doesn't sound like you're getting bored anytime soon. Um, no, no. I'll have to hunt you down and get you to sign a copy of uh, my my book from you as well. So off to find. When are you going to be in Chile? Uh, October. I'm trying to go down to Chile. So it, sometime, oh, sometime well, this we, fall. We, so maybe I'll <laughs> I'll stalk you down there or something. <laughs> Oh, that would be really cool. I mean, that is very much a digital nomad sounding way to hang out. Oh, yeah, totally. Thanks for coming on the podcast and everything and giving us a preview of what to expect from your book. Uh, for those of you who are listening, definitely go check it out. It's important to stay educated on this space. You can never get enough books. You can never get enough education when it comes to crypto. It's changing every single day, updating every single day. So make sure you get her book and check it out. And Again, thank you for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time and everything. Um, means a lot. Yeah, likewise. Means a lot to me as well. Talk to you again soon. All right. Bye.